Film editing is part of the creative post-production process of filmmaking. The term film editing is derived from the traditional process of working with film, but increasingly involves the use of digital technology. The film editor works with the raw footage, selecting shots and combining them into sequences to create a finished motion picture. Film editing is described as an art or skill, the only art that is unique to cinema, separating filmmaking from other art forms that preceded it. Although there are close parallels to the editing process in other art forms such as poetry and novel writing, Film editing is often referred to as the invisible act because when it is well practiced, the viewer can become so engaged that he or she is not even aware of the editor's work. On its most fundamental level, film editing is the art, technique, and practice of assembling shots into a coherent sequence. The job of an editor isn't simply to mechanically put pieces of a film together, cut off film slates, or edit dialogue scenes. A film editor must creatively work with the layers of images, story, dialogue, music, pacing, as well as the actor's performances to effectively reimagine and even rewrite the film to craft a cohesive whole. Editors usually play a dynamic role in the making of a film. Sometimes, auteurist film directors edit their own films, for example Akira Kurosawa and the Coen brothers. With the advent of digital editing, film editors and their assistants have become responsible for many areas of filmmaking that used to be the responsibility of others. For instance, in past years, picture editors dealt only with just that, picture, sound, music, and visual effects editors dealt with the practicalities of other aspects of the editing process, usually under the direction of the picture editor and director. However, digital systems have increasingly put these responsibilities on the picture editor. It is common, especially on lower-budget films, for the assistant editors or even the editor to cut in music, mock up visual effects, and add sound effects or other sound replacements. These temporary elements are usually replaced with more refined final elements by the sound, music, and visual effects teams hired to complete the picture. Film editing is an art that can be used in diverse ways. It can create sensually provocative montages, become a laboratory for experimental cinema, bring out the emotional truth in an actor's performance, create a point of view on otherwise obtuse events, guide the telling and pace of a story, create an illusion of danger where there is none, give emphasis to things that would not have otherwise been noted, and even create a vital subconscious emotional connection to the viewer, among many other possibilities. Editors can completely control how the audience feels emotionally throughout a film. History Early films were short films that were one long, static, and locked-down shot. Motion in the shot was all that was necessary to amuse an audience. So the first films simply showed activity such as traffic moving on a city street. There was no story and no editing. Each film ran as long as there was film in the camera. The use of film editing to establish continuity, involving action moving from one sequence into another, is attributed to British film pioneer Robert W. Paul's Come Along, Do, made in 1898 and one of the first films to feature more than one shot. In the first shot, an elderly couple is outside an art exhibition having lunch and then follow other people inside through the door. The second shot shows what they do inside. Paul's cinematograph camera no. 1 of 1896 was the first camera to feature reverse cranking, which allowed the same film footage to be exposed several times and thereby to create superpositions and multiple exposures. This technique was first used in his 1901 film Scrooge, or Marley's Ghost. The further development of action continuity in multi-shot films continued in 1899 to 1900 at the Brighton School in England, where it was definitively established by George Albert Smith and James Williamson. In that year Smith made Seen Through the Telescope in which the main shot shows street scene with a young man tying the shoelace and then caressing the foot of his girlfriend, while an old man observes this through a telescope. 
There is then a cut to close shot of the hands on the girl's foot shown inside a black circular mask, and then a cut back to the continuation of the original scene. Even more remarkable was James Williamson's attack on a China mission station, made around the same time in 1900. The first shot shows the gate to the mission station from the outside being attacked and broken open by Chinese boxer rebels. Then there is a cut to the garden of the mission station where a pitched battle ensues. An armed party of British sailors arrive and defeat the boxers and rescue the missionary's family. The film used the first reverse angle cut in film in history. James Williamson concentrated on making films taking action from one place shown in one shot to the next shown in another shot in films like Stop, Thief and Fire, made in 1901, and many others. He also experimented with the close-up, and made perhaps the most extreme one of all in The Big Swallow, when his character approaches the camera and appears to swallow it. These two filmmakers of the Brighton School also pioneered the editing of the film, they tinted their work with color and used trick photography to enhance the narrative. By 1900, their films were extended scenes of up to five minutes long. Other filmmakers then took up all these ideas including the American Edwin S. Porter, who started making films for the Edison Company in 1901. Porter worked on a number of minor films before making Life of an American Fireman in 1903. The film was the first American film with a plot, featuring action, and even a close-up of a hand pulling a fire alarm. The film comprised a continuous narrative over seven scenes, rendered in a total of nine shots. He put a dissolve between every shot, just as Georges Méliès was already doing, and he frequently had the same action repeated across the dissolves. His film, The Great Train Robbery, had a running time of 12 minutes, with 20 separate shots and 10 different indoor and outdoor locations. He used cross-cutting editing method to show simultaneous action in different places. These early film directors discovered important aspects of motion picture language, that the screen image does not need to show a complete person from head to toe and that splicing together two shots creates in the viewer's mind a contextual relationship. These were the key discoveries that made all non-live or non-live on videotape narrative motion pictures and television possible that shots can be photographed at widely different locations over a period of time and combined into a narrative whole. That is, the Great Train Robbery contained scenes shot on sets of a telegraph station, a railroad car interior, and a dance hall, with outdoor scenes at a railroad water tower, on the train itself, at her point along the track, and in the woods. But where the robbers leave the telegraph station interior and emerge at the water tower, the audience believes they went immediately from one to the other, or that when they climb on the train in one shot and enter the baggage car in the next, the audience believes they are on the same train. Sometime around 1918, Russian director Lev Kuleshov did an experiment that proves this point. He took an old film clip of a headshot of a noted Russian actor and intercut the shot with a shot of a bowl of soup, then with a child playing with a teddy bear, then with a shot an elderly woman in a casket. When he showed the film to people they praised the actor's acting, the hunger in his face when he saw the soup, the delight in the child, and the grief when looking at the dead woman. Of course, the shot of the actor was years before the other shots and he never saw any of the items. The simple act of juxtaposing the shots in a sequence made the relationship. Film editing technology before the widespread use of non-linear editing systems. The initial editing of all films was done with a positive copy of the film negative called a film work print by physically cutting and pasting. Together pieces of film, strips of footage would be hand cut and attached together with tape and then later in time, glue. 
Editors were very precise. If they made a wrong cut or needed a fresh positive print, it cost him money for the lab to reprint the footage and push the editing process back farther. With the invention of a splicer and threading machine with a viewer such as a Moviola, or flatbed machine such as a KEM, or Steenbeck, the editing process sped up a little bit and cut came out cleaner and more precise. Today, most films are edited digitally and bypass the film positive work print altogether. In the past, the use of a film positive allowed the editor to do as much experimenting as he or she wished, without the risk of damaging the original. With digital editing, editors can experiment just as much as before except with the footage completely transferred to a computer hard drive, losing the original footage is and only one computer crash away. When the film work print had been cut to a satisfactory state, it was then used to make an edit decision list. The negative cutter referred to this list while processing the negative, splitting the shots into rolls, which were then contact printed to produce the final film print or answer print. Today, production companies have the option of bypassing negative cutting altogether. With the advent of digital intermediate, the physical negative does not necessarily need to be physically cut and hot spliced together, rather the negative is optically scanned into computer, and a cut list is conformed by a die editor. Post-production, editors cut There are several editing stages and the editor's cut is the first. An editor's cut is normally the first pass of what the final film will be when it reaches picture lock. The film editor usually starts working while principal photography starts. Likely, prior to cutting, the editor and director will have seen and discussed dailies as shooting progresses. Screening dailies gives the editor a general idea of the director's intentions. Because it is the first pass, the editor's cut might be longer than the final film. The editor continues to refine the cut while shooting continues and often the entire editing process goes on for many months and sometimes more than a year, depending on the film. Director's cut when shooting is finished. The director can then turn his or her full attention to collaborating with the editor and further refining the cut of the film. This is the time that is set aside where the film editor's first cut is molded to fit the director's vision, while collaborating on what is referred to as the director's cut. The director and the editor go over the entire movie in great detail. Scenes and shots are reordered, removed, shortened and otherwise tweaked. Often it is discovered that there are plot holes, missing shots or even missing segments which might require that new scenes be filmed. Because of this time working closely and collaborating, a period that is normally far longer and far more intimately involved. Then, the entire production and filming, most directors and editors form a unique artistic bond. Final cut often after the director has had his chance to oversee a cut, the subsequent cuts are supervised by one or more producers, who represent the production company or movie studio. There have been several conflicts in the past between the director and the studio sometimes leading to the use of the Alan Smithy credit signifying when a director no longer wants to be associated with the final release. Continuity Continuity is a film term that suggests that a series of shots should be physically continuous, as if the camera simply changed angles in the course of a single event. For instance, if in one shot a beer glass is empty, it should not be full in the next shot. Live coverage of a sporting event would be an example of footage that is very continuous. Since the live operators are cutting from one live feed to another, the physical action of the shots matches very closely. Many people regard inconsistencies in continuity as mistakes, and often the editor is blamed. In film, however, continuity is very nearly last on a film editor's list of the important things to maintain. Technically, continuity is the responsibility of the script supervisor and film director, who are together responsible for preserving continuity and preventing errors from take-to-take -take and shot-to-shot. 
The script supervisor, who sits next to the director during shooting, keeps the physical continuity of the edit in mind as shots are set up. He is the editor's watchman. If shots are taken out of sequence, as is often the case, he will be alert to make sure that that beer glass is in the appropriate state. The editor utilizes the script supervisor's notes during post-production to log and keep track of the vast amounts of footage and takes that a director might shoot. Methods of Montage In motion picture terminology, a montage is a film editing technique. There are at least three senses of the term. In French film practice, montage has its literal French meaning and simply identifies editing. In Soviet filmmaking of the 1920s, montage was a method of juxtaposing shots to derive new meaning that did not exist in either shot alone. Soviet montage Lev Kuleshov was among the very first to theorize about the relatively young medium of the cinema in the 1920s. For him, of the unique essence of the cinemas, that which could be duplicated in no other medium, is editing. He argues that editing a film is like constructing a building. Brick by brick the building is erected. His often cited Kuleshov experiment established that montage can lead the viewer to reach certain conclusions about the action in a film. Montage works because viewers infer meaning based on context. Although, strictly speaking, U.S. Film director D.W. Griffith was not part of the montage school. He was one of the early proponents of the power of editing, mastering cross-cutting to show parallel action in different locations, and codifying film grammar in other ways as well. Griffith's work in the teens was highly regarded by Kuleshov and other Soviet filmmakers and greatly influenced their understanding of editing. Sergei Eisenstein was briefly a student of Kuleshov's, but the two parted ways because they had different ideas of montage. Eisenstein regarded montage as a dialectical means of creating meaning. By contrasting unrelated shots he tried to provoke associations in the viewer, which were induced by shocks. Montage sequence A montage sequence consists of a series of short shots that are edited into a sequence to condense narrative. It is usually used to advance the story as a whole, rather than to create symbolic meaning. In many cases, a song plays in the background to enhance the mood or reinforce the message being conveyed. One famous example of montage was seen in the 1968 film 2001, A Space Odyssey, depicting the start of man's first development from apes to humans. Another example that is employed in many films is the sports montage. The sports montage shows the star athlete training over a period of time, each shot having more improvement than the last. Classic examples include Rocky and the Karate Kid. Continuity Editing What became known as the popular, classical Hollywood, style of editing was developed by early European and American directors, in particular D.W. Griffith in his films such as The Birth of a Nation and Intolerance. The classical style ensures temporal and spatial continuity as a way of advancing narrative, using such techniques as the 180-degree rule, establishing shot, and shot reversed shot. Alternatives to Continuity Editing Early Russian filmmakers such as Lev Kuleshov further explored and theorized about editing and its ideological nature. Sergei Eisenstein developed a system of editing that was unconcerned with the rules of the continuity system of classical Hollywood that he called intellectual montage. Alternatives to traditional editing were also the folly of early surrealist and Dada filmmakers such as Louis Bunuel and René Clair. Both filmmakers, Claire and Bunwell, experimented with editing techniques long before what is referred to as MTV-style editing. The French New Wave filmmakers such as Jean-Luc Godard and François Truffaut and their American counterparts such as Andy Warhol and John Cassavetes also pushed the limits of editing technique during the late 1950s and throughout the 1960s. French New Wave films and the non-narrative films of the 1960s used a carefree editing style and did not conform to the traditional editing etiquette of Hollywood films. 
Like its Dada and Surrealist predecessors, French New Wave editing often drew attention to itself by its lack of continuity, its demystifying self-reflexive nature, and by the overt use of jump cuts or the insertion of material not often related to any narrative.